Good evening. Welcome to the 5 8, where we discuss each of the week's five most fucked up topics for eight minutes. Five topics, eight minutes, two hosts, a guest, except no guest tonight. It's just no the two of us tonight. tonight. Just the two of us tonight. Some singing, a lot of curse words, and as many cocktails as we deem necessary. LB, how are you? I'm good. I have a straw. That's very fancy of you. I feel I, better with a straw. You feel better with a straw. I like a um, straw with my water. You what know, are you having? You're having your Manhattan? I'm having my back to the Manhattan. The straw would work when you have that mask on. When you've got the mask with the red lights. Yes. I yeah. haven't thought of that. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what I'm the straw is do for. it with my yeah. mask. Yeah. Yeah. Because I literally good. was like, today, I was kind of, I had it on today. And I was thirsty. And I was like, I couldn't figure out how to do it. So. A straw. A straw. Is how you do it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're yeah, welcome. Thanks, thanks yeah. Greg. Thanks. Yeah. Help me out. Um, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Um, so, uh. It's been a crazy week. It's I think, been a, a crazy bit. week. I mean, I don't know that we come in with a joke right at the top unless you've got one. Oh, I've have some. I wrote them during. Oh, the, okay, I, good. Thank God. All right. Let's during, have during the during the um the the opening credits there. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, let's have some. Now jokes. we know you. I don't know if you knew this because this was later yesterday that the oh. MAGA like contingent in the House that they don't want the Mike Johnson thing to succeed and they're afraid that if they leave, people will sneak stuff into these bills. That they don't. Okay, want. which Mike Johnson thing? You mean the Ukraine? The Ukraine bill, which we'll talk aid? about later. Okay. Right. But the, so right. they, the, this group yeah. of the Bobert and Marjorie, the the, oh, the idiots, you know, the, the, the traitors. Okay. They, yeah. They 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 formed a team which is called um, the Floor Action Response Team to prevent oh. this from happening. So one of them is like a watch. They did not. They did. It's a watch where one of them's always there to make sure that some thing won't happen and it's called the floor action response team which is fart fart is that real greg it is alas yes it is it is real and it makes sense i mean if you think about the way that these guys are you know projection is what they do and as we know whoever denied it supplied it so it totally makes sense yes now speaking of farts yeah. <laughs> i don't know if you knew this but apparently trump you know was unable to control himself uh, in court again today. Not I just think the sniffing. Was a fart. I think he probably went in his diaper, which he does. Well, you know, horrible he, smell. People have been trying to get it out there about how horrible this man smells. It's terrible. You know, he he did raise a stink <laughs> on Truth Social, and he is trying to stir up shit. Uh, That's true. He is trying to stir up shit. I mean, he doing it a little bit literally, but I think the main takeaway here is that. If you could ask his lawyers, they will attest he gives a new meaning to the word gag order. Okay. Ah, I'm, I'm done with my joke. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent joke. That's it. That's it. Good job. Great yeah, little. thanks. Well, you know, poor Diane Feinstein. I think that was her last memory, you know, is just that when she, yeah. when he farted nice to her. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. I okay, mean, well, probably not. His lawyers probably aren't going to get COVID 19 from the fart, like poor Jenna Ellis, but. Yeah. Still bad. Well, that's a Rudy fart. That comes with a little bit more. Uh, it does. It's got a yeah. little bit more. Uh, lay, there's a few more layers going on in that. It's like yeah. a hickey from Kaniki, you know? It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like exactly. a hickey from Kaniki. Um, um, okay, so something else happened at the courthouse today. Outside the courthouse, I don't want to just roll past this and not address it because it's all over the news now. And uh, I don't know how old this man was. I assume it was a younger man. Um, self-emulated. So we're moving into that moment in history where people are setting themselves on fire. I read his, I don't want to call it a manifesto because I think it was a, it was just a, a plea, um, you know, but maybe technically manifesto, typically those things when they're written before someone commits some act against others, usually not themselves, um, you know, it's full of just terrible words and calling people things and usually something horribly radicalized and to see what this, this was someone who was just very lost, but also had focused on Peter Thiel and Peter Thiel's corruption and cryptocurrency corruption um, and fall, fell into that and started trying to find meaning and patterns and ended up with the Simpsons and, you know, but it was not, there wasn't like a curse word in it. And it wasn't like that, that kind of stood out to me that um, he was trying to be kind 
and keep that kindness, but just crying out for a lot of help. So, um, I hope he recovers. Yeah. I, What's going to happen there? Very sad. I found that very sad. No, it's, those are my it's thoughts on it. The, well, the other thing we were talking about before we turned the, you know, before we turned the camera on is, yeah. you know, if you go through the thing, you can spot these patterns. If you have the right mind and the right kind yeah. of ability to spot the patterns, you spot them. And then eventually you become convinced that what you see has to be the right pattern, even though it's like that New York Times game. It's called like, I think it's called Connections, where you're trying to figure it. And sometimes it's just wrong. You guess it and it's just yeah. wrong, you know, and that happens. And from what I, I have not studied this thing that he wrote in any great detail, but I did read it. And the mistake that he makes, the fallacy that he appears to make, in my opinion, is what I call the monolith fallacy, which is believing that there's this hidden hand and everything right. is in perfect concert and marching and lockstep because the you know, the builder burgers and the whatever the hell. And it's like, no, six rich guys don't agree on where to go for dinner. They don't, you know, hundreds it's of people. Organized. Don't really, yeah, it's yeah. not. It's There's not. a lot of malevolence. There's a lot of darkness. Yeah. There's a, a massive division of wealth. Yes, a point, oh, 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 one percent have figured out how to just rape and pillage and not even have faced a single consequence. And they find these things and they, they grab as much money as they can out of them. They create schemes, they create inst financial instruments and just, you know, rob people blind. Yes. Um, but they're not, you know, organized together. And some, it's just, it's sad. So yeah. um, got to touch grass every once in a while, you know, and listen to your family. If they're trying to say you've gone too far in this and we're worried about you. Yeah. If your family says that and Steve Bannon and Roger Stone are saying, no, no, run for president, it's probably not a good idea to run for president. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, yeah. We don't even have a we don't even have an opportunity to get to that topic today because we have others we need to dive topics. into, yeah. even though it's just you and I. Yep. So it's going to hopefully be, you know, a neat. It's the five, eight, neat, everybody. It's the five, eight, neat. It's the five, eight, neat. Nice, clean show. Yeah. All right, here I go. I'm setting my timer. Are we ready for our first topic? The first topic, yeah. Here we go. All right. It's songs. Uh, yeah. These are Joni Mitchell songs. I did not approve of this, but it's fine. It's fine. It's I was fine. told other titles. Songs to Aging happen. Children Come. So uh, we have to talk about Arizona because this Arizona 1864 thing is, um, it's just, it's yeah. not going away. And the more you look into the, kind of the crazier it it gets right like what 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 are you, what are your thoughts on this subject for this week lb well here's what happened i looked at the law imagine that mm. i went and looked at it and what i am going to say now is what i wish the reporting about this how it would cover it i think the air is it the arizona current i can't remember the name of it chronicle something there's some great local arizona paper that i've found it in and read, read it and the coverage has been good. I just wish in talking about this, especially if you're an activist, if you're in a group of activists and you're working on messaging and you're trying to help with campaigns and get the messaging together around abortion. Yes, embracing that word is the first and foremost thing we all must do and just not make it this thing that we can't say anymore. It's abortion, it's a medical procedure, full stop. Um, and we need that because we're it's the year 2024 hello. Yeah. Like we need our medicine to be of this, at least this decade. How about just shooting for this century that we're in? We're 20, almost a quarter of a way into this century. We are. It's time to be in it instead of in the last century, which was great. I had a great time in the last century and certainly not the century before that. All right. So what it struck me about this is it's a marriage law. A marriage law? Yes. Mm. It's a marriage law in the time and in the era where marriage was for the man to take a piece of property and expand his property holdings because women were the property of the man legally in terms of this is a law. We're talking about laws. So it's a marriage law. And so it's rules for the man. And so 
the one of the rules is um, they had to pick an age. What's the minimum age of this property you're going to take into your bed and start your procreation journey? Well, the the minimum age, they just were like, can it be a three-year-old? Some of these men must have been thinking, how about a four-year-old, a five-year-old? Clearly, they were focused on children and they landed on 10. All right. As soon as it gets, as soon as the property, the girl, the 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 thing that's gonna that you're gonna take into your bed reaches the age of 10, double digits, then you can marry her. Then you can take her into the bed. So they had to sort of set a line there. So I want to talk about this as a marriage law because we need to set everybody in the mindset of what was what this actually was back in 18. What the fuck was it? 34? 64. 64. Yeah. Pardon me. In the middle of the Civil War. Right towards the, the end of the Civil War. Yeah. Okay. And then the other things that go along with the rules for the man with marriage in Arizona in 1864 were okay you want a child uh, but we're going to we're going to make it at least 10 two digits there's got to be two digits then it was you also you can't marry you know uh, we won't protect you in these marriage laws and we'll make it a crime actually if you interracially marry and of course you can't you know let since we're talking about the bedroom and procreation there's some rules around that when it comes to lgbt all of that which they just Called, they didn't even have those words then. They just called it one. And they said something from the Bible that was horrible. They put in the law. So uh, for uh, 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 relationships that are not uh, born man, born woman. Okay. And then there's underneath all of that, since you're taking, you know, your piece of property and these are the marriage laws and marriage is about procreation or maybe even expanding your wealth if you're, if she's coming with a dowry. Um, but it's about, you know, having heirs and, and doing your plantation shit or whatever. So in that property ownership relationship, there were rules of what you could do as the man, you can't perform or have a, an abortion performed on your property. So now I'm keeping it in that very strict language. They talk about it a little bit differently, but I'm telling you what it was at the time why the laws were they with Arizona deemed it necessary to have laws around marriage because marriage was a legal agreement. You're entering into something legally so that the man had ownership, legal ownership over his property, which is a child can be a child if they wanted or it could be older, but you know, Arizona, they were like, yeah. Well, the guy yeah. that started the law too, child in your bed, let's well, you know, 10. That, that your property needs to be 10 years old. Talk about it that way so that when people try to defend it, you're landing them or you're coming up against in language about someone, you're just trying to explain to someone, you're landing them in the moment of what that law was actually all about. I think that's important. Personally, I think it's important. I think it'll work. It also... To your point, and I agree, obviously I agree that this is what we should be doing. This is the political party that likes to talk about originalism and get in the brain of the founding Ooh. fathers. So let's get in the brain of the guy that wrote the uh, Arizona 1864 law. This guy that was with not one, not two, but I believe three girls under the age of, was it 14 or 15? I can't. I, I think can't it's 12, you. 13, and 14, I yeah, want to say. I might be so. wrong. Might be off by a year, but clearly a serial pedophile. Who yeah. was living in Arizona, probably because he had to leave the East Coast, the polite society, uh, and went there and said, I'm going to make this place legal for me to do my perverted, awful shit. So that's the law that they're going for. And that's the mentality, the originalist mentality of the guy that wrote it. So, you know. Yeah. What do these Republicans want, LB? It seems to me that they just, they don't, they're not going to stop just at abortion. It seems to me that they want what this guy wanted. I think that's a fair question to ask them. That's right. You know, why are you doing this? Is there some that we should, you know, prevent you from seeing? Yeah. Disgusting. Disgraceful. Yeah. All of them. Disgraceful. All of them. Horrible, mm -hmm. horrible, terrible. Yep. Okay. 50 seconds left. I, one little quick thing that you brought up earlier around all of that is also, does that mean that those laws go into effect just so we can be clear? No, because what happened with Dobbs was the, Supreme Court, as we all know, kicked it back down to the states and say, 
you guys figure out your own laws around all of this. And that was the last recorded law on the book when it, right. before Roe, um, when it came to uh, abortion specifically, they have up the age of, you know, that they don't have child marriage there like a lot of states do unless there's parental consent it can be 16 but otherwise you got to be 18 to be married um so and i still consider parental consent 16 <laughs> just like that's it's absurd yeah. um so uh but so that law comes after this law for on their state in their state record so that's what would be proceeding but it's worth it to challenge them Right. Yeah. Uh, about how where that these marriage laws, are you going after these other things? Because I can't imagine there's st state laws on those other topics as well, other than age of marriage. I, I don't know. I'll have to look into it. And um, hey, they rolled back. They rolled, rolled back row. They rolled, they rolled, back rolled that row. back after 50 years. Why can't they roll this back, too? Yeah. You know, if it's that important for them to marry a, a girl who's 10 years old, you know. I think yeah. that. Yeah, this is something that needs to be albatross hung about their necks. Okay, yeah. next topic. Next topic is it's too disgusting to keep talking about it. It really is. Arizona is gross. Yeah. Goodbye, Sorry, Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. Sorry, Arizona. You're yeah. off the list. Yuck. Okay, media and the NPR. Yeah. Well, we'll get to the NPR possibly because we get we've got a lot. Yeah, yeah. About. We're gonna get. We're gonna, gonna talk get to about. That. Um, you've got this. So both sides now. What, this sort of the, I, weird journalism is tripping itself up still. Yeah, yeah. Like I had Gal Suburban on the podcast, uh, which dropped today. So we, we were talking, I guess, over the weekend and I kind of was fumbling around this idea. Uh, it just sort of came out organically there, but it occurred to me that the reason why journalists in the United States have such a problem, I think, this is my hypothesis, covering Trump and the MAGA movement and the neo-fascist GOP is because of this both sides business, right? And what I mean by that is journalists in this country are trained to present, you know, quote unquote, both sides of a view. There, there aren't really two sides to the view. It, it As, um, you know, our guest a couple of weeks ago um, said, you know, just having two sides means all the other sides are removed from view. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Traditionally, journalists in this country to be, quote unquote, objective, say, OK, the Democrats say this, the Republicans say that we want to present reporting. this. Right. Yeah. We want to present this those ways. Right. That's how they're trained, because in this country, that's how it's really always been. It's been. You know, I think we should have this be, uh, you know, we should vote this way. I think that we should vote the other way. The journalists write about it and they present both sides. And that's just the article. Right. But we're now in a phase where the Republican Party has been co-opted by fascists. It is a fascist party. It is run by a strongman. It is not a political party in the democratic sense of the word, small d democratic sense of the word. And journalists in this country do not know what to fucking do with that. They don't know what to make of it. It, it defies their training. So they have to go back to, you know, well, we have to both sides, you know, there's a level, there's a line after which you don't need to both sides it anymore. You don't need to both sides what Hitler was doing. You don't need to. We don't well, care. Because there's not two sides of one coin. Yeah. With it, it, this. Yeah. We get two different coins. Yeah. It's two different coins. And it's inherent, like a free press, if you're a journalist, your primary motive has to be protection of the free press, because without the free press, your job doesn't exist anymore. There is no journalism in any fundamental way without a free press. It's just all state propaganda. That's what it is. Now, I have this book. I brought some, some aids. This book is called Striking Back, um, Overt and Covert Options to Combat Russian Disinformation. And it's written by Thomas Kent, Tom Kent, who was the, uh, when I was at AP, he was the um, the foreign editor of all of the foreign news there. Yeah. Um, and he writes this interesting thing about the role of journalists. And I just want to talk about this because I think this is interesting. Like we're in an evolution, I think. And this book is a few years old, but we're, we're, the role of the journalist in this country is evolving. He writes, um, you know, independent journalists, 
uh, can be a potent force against Russian intelligence operations, but journalists conceive of their roles in very different ways. Some are of the quote unquote objective school, claiming to simply cover the news without advocating for any cause. Their principles prevent them from taking political positions, teaming up with activists, or often taking government money. In contrast to the objective camp, independent journalists can be, quote, point of view reporters, openly standing for a cause. From their perspective, this does not keep them from working ethically and grounding their work on facts. They just believe the facts are on their side. Point of view journalists may be the majority in at-risk countries, where Western traditions of journalistic impartiality can seem secondary to an immediate need to counter corruption and conspiracies. That's what happens in crap countries. And now it's starting to happen here. And that's why they're having problems. He also writes on the next page here, almost all journalists, even those working for outlets that espouse objectivity, intrinsically favor a free press because their work depends on media freedom. So what I take this to mean is that it really is okay to call out the bullshit on this. If they're, if any, whether it's a Democrat or Republican or anybody else, if they're calling for something that's curtailing freedom of speech, like really freedom of speech, not what Elon Musk thinks that means, <laughs> uh, and freedom of the press, journalists have to tell us. That's really the most important thing they can be doing right now, honestly. Um, I, I mean, other than doxing potential jurors for, for the Trump trial. Obviously that's primary, but the secondary Ooh, thing they should be doing is, yeah. is uh, oh, smack, sorry. That just, just came up. Uh, yeah. Seriously though, the, the, they need to be doing this. And, you know, pivoting towards the, the NPR brouhaha. Um, I read this article by this reporter who worked for NPR for a long time, kind of talking about the, you know, why he perceives the changes and how NPR has changed. And he's complaining essentially that basically there's not enough, what he considers balanced coverage or objective coverage, but he's between Democrats and Republican sides. And he goes on to complain that in the newsroom, it's just literally all Democrats and no Republicans and how that's bad. But what he doesn't account for is the fact that the Republican party is a fucking fascist party. Right. Anybody that's really hardcore Republican now is basically, you know, Mussolini 2.0 and has no, Mussolini literally destroyed the presses that the physical presses, he broke them up and destroyed them. So that having that person in the newsroom is not necessary. It, it's just not necessary. Uh, you know, it, it's, no, it's and, not I, and, the, and the press is, is not liberal. <laughs> By nature, yeah. it's not. It actually, it's owned by corporations um, now. And there's a lot of, it, and it's been organized around where it used to be back in the day. We can watch those great films, not from that too long ago, right? But where, you know, I think it was The Insider where you see Mike Wallace and then you've got the, you know, the attorneys trying to say, well, you know, don't do it this way because we might get sued. And he tears them an asshole and reminds them, you know, you're not here. <laughs> Uh, to to mo to make you know somehow curb my reporting. You're here. Let them sue me. Fucking great. You're here to go fight for the freedom of the press in the courts. If they even if anybody attempts to do that, in because they take offense at the at the facts coming out. So you know there has been a flip, and we've talked about that in the in the newsroom where you've got. Uh, you know, these sort of attorneys, business affairs is controlling what's coming out of the mouths of the reporters yeah. and, and telling them and in their ear about what they can and can't say. And so with who are trying to do actual journalism and coverage, there's all this fear about lawsuits. So that's also something that needs to just, you know, we need the heads of these news organizations separate from the studios that own them and the corporations that own them to come in and really empower their, their corporate attorneys to fight for the freedom of the press as well. You're going to need it at, from that, from that angle, let them sit, you report how you need to report to all the reporters. Anybody calls and threatens you, we're taking, we'll take them to court, right? We'll like turn it around. So that's got to turn around as well. I think for the both sides thing, for me, it's, I shouldn't have said it's two different coins. It's like 
there's the coin that used to have two sides of a policy issue, but everybody was American and everyone was in the small d democracy. And now you have um, journalists normalizing, I think is what you're going for, because they don't know what else to do, but just right. keep treating this clear fascist party as if it's just the old Republicans, but maybe they're embracing new ways or they have new style that they're doing things or they have, oh, look, they have Russian masters, okay? They're, they're just spewing Kremlin talking points. Well, okay, that's new for them. As if any of that is still part of the, de the small D democratic process. Right. It's just not. So it's a coin and a guillotine. That's what we have. And you don't stick your neck in the guillotine and say, well, I guess that's what I have to do because they're telling me I have to do that in order to be fair and impartial. I'm going to cut my head off. <laughs> I like that. That's, that's very well put the, the whole, by the way, um, Katie Brownell was on a couple of weeks ago in her book. I learned that the origin of the whole liberal press thing happened because some of the more racist broadcast networks complained that the media wasn't allowing their pro segregation content to be aired. Oh. You're all liberals, not letting the pro segregation. Yeah. So that's what it comes from. It's like from the 1950s and from horrible racists. So I think there's probably an Arizona marriage law that they would also love. <laughs> yeah. That we could find. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't have any tips for how they should be covering it differently, other than I did like that guy, Daniel. I can't remember his name. I hope he's back. I haven't checked who would fact check every single lie and just report the lies oh, and right. call the yeah. lies the lies. And that was very helpful. I thought yeah. that was good journalism. Okay. This is the man everyone elected president. Here's the lies. Here's the lies from the press secretary. Here's the, and just constantly go through the lies. These are, these are things that are being said and being fed to the American people and they are lies. Yeah, that yeah. guy was good. Dale, I think his name was. Dale. Maybe like, yeah, he's around. He's Canadian. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then one little quick little thing on the NPR thing. So it's, it, it, there's a, a nugget in that. So there was this employee who had decided that the whole newsroom was woke, right? And they cared more about that than uh, actually finding the news or putting the news or looking for stories to amplify some kind of woke message, right? Of all the woke messaging. And we heard Bill Barr. I saw Bill Barr this week back on his daily crawl caller crack. You could tell because he's back. He's like, well, we just have to stop the, the progressive agenda. No matter, even though I'll vote for this guy, you know, because we have to stop the progress because that's the most dangerous thing for America. So it's the, um, that's that as a thing of grievance for for white men, because all of a sudden their point of view, they never a lot of these men never perceived that their point of view wasn't the global point of view, that actually there were many other points of view um, that were being suppressed is so that only a white male Christian typically point of view could be expressed. Um, they just assume that this is this is this is it. My it's all fact and truth. My you know, um, and so I had a little, I have a little story. I don't know where to tell that, but um, of seeing that in real time in my profession, um, where there was very much run by white male writers for a very 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 long time. It's changing now. And the changes are just in the last couple of years. And I was listening to a group of, of these writers who were television writers. Um, and I'd heard these complaints before, but they were really complaining over tequila about how they just, oh, I could sell at least two shows every season or at least one show I got to get picked up and da, 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 and complaining about, oh, it's just like, you can't even be a white male writer anymore and have and be a creator. These are creators on the side of creation that like staffing. Um, and you know, it's just this bitch fest and, and I just, <laughs> I'd heard enough of it and I just lost it on them, but not in a very aggressive way. I just was like, <laughs> welcome to the party. Glad to have you here. Now you know what it's like. And by the way, you're still very, very privileged, but imagine being a woman 
try and having trying to have a track record of selling shows like that. Right? Forget about just even getting in the room so you can pitch it. Or <laughs> or God forbid, a person of color or oh my god, the worst scenario. A woman of color. Right? We're lucky if 10% of what we even have to say at any given moment penetrates the brains of the people that we need to be talking to in order to get hired. Because they're sitting there thinking about, God only knows. I, it depends on how I show up. If I show up looking great, you can imagine what I'm, what I'm you know, the morass that I'm trying to get through to hold them in my hand to t tell a story and have them focus on characters. Or they're thinking about their wife, or they're thinking about their girlfriend, or they're thinking about their mother. This is, this is like, it's so maybe 10% of what I have to say gets through, and maybe they like that. And then maybe they're willing to like put their job on a line and take a risk on some woman thinking she can write a sci fi show. Right? Even though I have a track record that matches that is in parallel with these men you know, if we're in the feature side, at least, if not more, having more feature experience than them and, um, you know, and still walking away only if I get the job um, or I make the sale with 10% of their pay. We are dealing with that too. So the grievance out of these men that they just had to, you know, and I just said, so you're, you know, yeah, you're going to have to be a 10 or an 11. You're going to have to make sure every single person Thing. When your fingertips touch that keyboard, every single word that comes out is original. You're going to have to have new ideas. You're going to have to jar them with your writing because it's got so much acceleration to it that they cannot look away, that they have to, have to, have to pick that up. If you put something down in writing and they're reading it, or if you're in the room that they cannot say no to you, that there is no no. You're going to have to make every single moment like that. And then you know what it's like to walk in our shoes. These are just lazy fucks. So <laughs> guy in the newsroom, you're just being lazy because nobody wants to sit there and listen to your fucking stories anymore. Or if they do, it's not a guarantee that you walk away with the, with the byline, with the above the fold, with the whatever the fuck it is in your thing, with the deal. It's not a guarantee that everybody's going to turn around and go, oh, God, he's so amazing. Isn't he amazing? Oh, my God, he's so amazing. What an original idea. Oh, let's do that. That's what their grievance is. Yeah. 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 Woke my ass. Please. Now, <laughs> quickly, because we're running long on the topic, but thank you for sharing that story. Anyway, I wish I, I story. to be a fly on the wall there. At the tequila oh, bar. oh, they hate me. <laughs> oh no, they they never they were never gonna hire me. And I wasn't there to hire. I was just listening to them. Those men in that moment fucking hated me. Yeah, because you tell really? them the truth. You're telling yeah. them that they're not as that good was as not a mirror be. they wanted held up to them. No. And they don't no. want to walk a, a, a second in my shoes. No way. They know how good they have it. Still to this day. Yeah. Yeah. But boy, do they bitch. Oh my God. I never heard complaining like this. Oh, it was like a Kardashian family complaining <laughs> about, you know, some lip gloss that didn't work the way it needed to work. Okay. Or they didn't make a billion dollars in last month. They only made, you know, 900 million. I mean, you know, that I is mean. pretty awful. That, that's right. pretty awful. Um, Okay, so when you were talking about Bill Barr, yeah, I thought you said Bill Maher, and oh. I realized that's another simulation thing. Bill Maher, Bill Barr, same white guy grievance. That's right. Talk you know. about, oh my God, he can't stop complaining about how hard it was for him and how campus is, and oh my God, the wokeness and how it's just shutting him down as he cashes his million-dollar paychecks and has his show on the air for season 39. Yeah, that's it. Um, quickly, just to, to, to wrap it up with the NPR guy, whose name, by the way, is Yuri, I think it's Yuri Berliner. Um, oh, what is he was complaining oh. about what he called um, 
viewpoint diversity, which I think is a real thing. And I think he's right in a sense to talk about it because what that means, basically, I have a quick story. Um, this is from AP. When, when Kurt Cobain died, okay, mm -hmm. on that horrible day, the Seattle news office uh, of the AP found out about it and they called the general desk in New York uh, and, and basically said, you need to put this on the wire. And the wire is like the, you know, the 10 or 12 top stories. And the person at the general desk was this old guy who was like, ah, what? I don't, that's not news. And the, and the Seattle person was like, you need to put this on the A wire. It has to be there. And had to explain to this very old out of touch guy that Kurt Cobain dying was a really fucking important story, even though he didn't know who he was. So right. uh, that's what it is by viewpoint diversity. It's like, I remember I used to do like these orientations there and be like, okay, what does diverse really mean? Like, does George W. Bush's cabinet, is it diverse? And it is in a sense, because you had different, you know, Condi Rice was there and you had different, you know, you had women, you had people of color, et cetera. But they're all conservative, you know, right leaning guys viewpoint. at all about the same. Yeah. So, yeah. So it it is a thing to consider. But, uh, you know, the way that he's considering it, I think, is flawed because, again, he fails to, I, to, to, you know, take into account the fact that the Republican Party has morphed into a fascist party. That's right. And that journalists have to combat that. OK, we have to move on. I'm going to take the banner down. Oh, for a minute. For a minute think, because it, something else. Let's. Let's peek in. Can we peek in on on Donald and the Yeah, court? let's see how he's doing. Let's see how he's doing. Stay awake, maybe take a little break from truth social. I know it's boring, but you're snoring. I'm imploring you wake up. Judge Mershon isn't one of our Aileen Cannon ringers. In court, time is short, but not as short as your fingers. Oh, little baby, little baby boy. If it was one day sooner, I could have, I could have made the rhyme fart lingers. I could have lingers and fingers could have been the thing, but no. Oh, well. Nice. Yeah. Good job, Chunk. Thank you for animating that. Thank you, always, Chunk. Always, always fantastic. Amazing. Always fantastic. It's so it's such a it's such a wonderful thing to give him something and see it transform like that. All right. Um, I'm yeah. putting a I'm putting our timer on on this next one. Yeah. But we'll yeah. go over. <laughs> oh, whatever. It's fine. Um, okay. We'll go over. This Are you is ready? a really long segment with the guests, but it's our it's our neat show. Yeah. So, okay, um, Court and Spark, what that means is that, I didn't know if you knew this, but the former president of the United States was in a criminal trial in New York City this week. Um, yeah. Jury selection was happening, and people were going kind of ape shit because he was doing weird things, and um, people <laughs> were writing stuff like, it almost kind of seems like he's acting like he's maybe in the mob or something. So, LB... As someone who uh, has been, has been, your your tagline on Twitter is just mob. You've been saying yeah. this for eight years now, yeah. And you have a whole podcast about it called "The World Beneath" for anyone, yeah. you know, unaware who's watching. Uh, and you know all about this stuff and about specifically Donald Trump's long history with the uh, mafia, both Italian and Russian. Yeah. Uh, what did you see looking at his behavior uh, as he's intimidating witnesses and stuff today? I mean, well, welcome to the mob. This is it. <laughs> so it's, this is the, of course, there's, I, I think there's stuff we probably don't know about yet um, that maybe Judge Marshawn was just sort of passing over. So typically you've got uh, with these trials um, where there's accountability happening, um, it's going to be, uh, and I'm going to sort of the, the era before Donald Fred's era. Um, his dad, who was also, he was the business front. That's the business that put for, built a $400 million empire was all on being the business front for organized crime, the crime families in New York in terms of real estate and development. And you'll hear people maybe in the media try to couch that now that they're talking about it again, as if it's some new thing. 
um, couch that as like, well, it's New York. And so anybody who was involved in construction had to kind of do business with the mafia. That's not what the Trump family is, which is why you're hearing so much deflection about the Biden crime family, because the Trump family is actually a crime family. It's a, it's a for, generationally. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a business that Donald inherited. Um, it was his first real foray into it was set up. And you guys have heard, heard me say this many, many times. It's worth just constantly repeating um, around the, with the car concrete cartel. He tells that story of, you know, I wanted to do build in Manhattan. My dad told me that's not our territory. And then he has this little thing he says where he gave me a million dollars to start my project. And that's how I built the big Trump empire. When none of that's the last part of it's true. But I have no doubt that Fred said, that's not our territory. You can't build in Manhattan um, because the crime family that that Fred was primarily uh, the front for and the and the work. I mean, he did work. They did. This was a real they had a, he had a real company. He developed all these properties, but he developed them for with and for uh, the Genovese crime family. And so the Manhattan where Donald wanted to build Trump Tower was not they didn't have a deal <laughs> like that. That's a different crime family. That was a Gambino crime family in that. And you uh, all maybe heard uh, the old tapes of, you know, Sammy the Bull Gravano talking about how he built Manhattan with concrete and that he looks at it and he marvels at it. And people like Donald Trump would never have had a, anything without him. And that's true. Um, so at that time, it was Paul Castellano that was head of the Gambino crime family. I heard John Cody's name drop this week in, in by Tim O'Brien talking about how John Cody had an apartment in Trump Tower. Everybody should know. And Cody was a big gangster and mobster. He ran the Teamster concrete side of things. Um, and uh, he kept his mistress. He was building something for his mistress in Trump Tower. That was all like this Trump Tower thing being this concrete when everybody had moved to steel was because, yes, Donald was in business with the mafia, but it really, the origins of it were the origins of what became known as the concrete cartel. So in order for Donald to develop and build a property in Manhattan, two crime families had to come to an agreement of how they were going to allow this to happen. Like who gets what, right? If the, if the Genovese business fronts are moving in and, and at the, if Salerno at that time was the head of the Genovese crime family, and they want to, Donald wants to develop in, in Manhattan, then, then uh, the fat Tony Salerno is going to have to do a deal with Paul Castellano. And so a commission was formed of the five heads of the families. And I, they had a commission already. We know about the, you know, you hear those, you see those old De Niro movies where they touch on this, where everyone was out, you know, back in the t days of, um, you know, Frank Costello and, and Lucky Luciano, these great big mobsters, and they all got caught in a cornfield in upstate New York and they went running from the feds because they were having their commission meeting, right? So yes, a commission existed, but the commission in terms of how Manhattan would be developed was the heads of the five families. And the first time they chose to work together, as we know is recorded history, and there may be other times, but this is what we know in recorded history, was for Fred, for his boy Donald. All, and that was what became known as the commission trials, right? To go after the concrete cartel. And the concrete cartel, where it was, it was bid fixing and rigging in the city of uh, New York, in the greater metropolitan area of New York uh, City, where the, the like seven bids would go into the city to build a particular project, but all seven of them, those were prefixed bids from mafia controlled companies. And then the winning bid, whoever got the winning bid was already decided ahead of time because they knew they were going to develop it. So um, how Trump was able to do this was Fat Tony Salerno and Paul Costellano formed a company called SNA Concrete. John Cody, head of the Teamsters Union for the Concrete, was the one that chapter overseeing the project. And that's the company that did the bid rigging to get the job to, in order to bid, build Trump Tower, but it all been predetermined ahead of time. That key piece of evidence and was captured on FBI audio tapes 
as the commission trials were going after the first big application of the RICO Act for mafia families to go after this concrete cartel and take out the heads of the five families, the very case that Rudy Giuliani supposedly made his big thing on. This is, this is what it is. So he's not just any construction person around Manhattan that has to kind of, oh, all right, I got to pay off a mobster in order to build my thing or da, 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 da. He's literally from the bowels of the commission of the concrete cartel. Donald Trump would not exist as a personality even today if it weren't for two mafia bosses agreeing on the commission to form a company in order to build Fred's boys tower, which was really for them with John Cody overseeing it. That's a very different story. You need to tell the story that way. So that's who Donald is. That's all he's ever known. These are the only businessmen he's ever known. This is it, as in terms of raised at his father's knee. This is how his paradigm for the world, this is how he thinks the world works, right? He was caught in several, and I think in that trial, I think they, I can't imagine the FBI wouldn't have knocked on his doors. Like your name is being dropped all over these tapes, <laughs> right? And we're having this big, huge trial. So tell us what you know. I'm sure he handed over information um, at that point in time. I, we know that he did hand over information during his money laundering trial for the Atlantic City casinos, because all of a sudden all those indictments disappeared and whoop, Ivanka, a Russian gangster was who was hiding out, and, like was all of a sudden in custody and they've been trying to find this guy forever. So um, he had a Philly crew. Um, he was in with the Philadelphia mob for also in developing Atlantic City. So this is all arranged by his father and it's all he's ever known. So what are we seeing now in this trial? You're seeing how an actual organized crime boss, even though he's a business friend, operates. It's the same operation. It's just happening in the courtroom. So it's thuggery, right? We've got, what's thuggery in a courtroom? I don't know what they might've done to Mershon. I can't imagine he didn't get some kind of phone call or passerby like what Stormy Daniels had when she had her kid, like some kind of don't threaten judges. They want it like, we don't have this guy in our pocket. Can you get a hold of his financials? You know, God only knows what's going on there that we don't know this happened. But the other first moves are going to be witness intimidation. Yeah, that happens now, right? Exactly. Who the witnesses are so we can intimidate them. Um, and jury tampering. So exactly. yeah, that's happening now as well. What's coming down the pipe from that is you're going to see false testimony. You're going to see um, chaos. Uh, you're going to see press that is, we already have this, that's sort of in the bag for him. That's going to carry things to try to sway public opinion, try to influence everything. And you're going to see waters, go fuck yourself. Sorry. Yeah, you're going to see all that stuff. Um, and you're going to see hear a lot of moaning and complaining. One of the things we would see in for the day of the mobsters that Donald knew and that Fred was in business with is you'd see the older guys, like certainly his age, he's old, he's up there, Donald, right? You'd see those old codgers like him come in frail. Like, like they might wear like oxygen masks <laughs> they're being wheeled in, in the wheelchair. Right. Um, and they just play this sort of victim. You had, you know, there was an infamous mobster who you spent, two years pretending he was had lost his mind walking around in a bathrobe while he was running, <laughs> you know, he's running things from his kitchen and had no idea the feds had a wiretap in there. Um, so, and that was all to avoid um, some type of sentencing or some type of, uh, you know, coming, coming out with a conviction in whatever they were being held to in trial. Uh, Donald is in a crisis here and he's in an early crisis for, for a mafia Dawn, right? So, and his crisis is happening around this courtroom. So I think we're going to start to see some flailing and the crisis is this, and they all face this. I'm a master of a universe in a shadow world. And so I can't let anybody know I'm the master of the universe, or that means I'm guilty. Right? That's what mafia bosses face. And eventually, as they're looking at the end of their life, 
they all find a writer and they all write about it because they're like, I can't die and not have the world know everything that I built, everything that I controlled. You know, these are the men that had global empires. They were masters of the universe. Um, where it's different for Donald is he didn't run the world and then <laughs> he did it. And so he got to brag about running the world and, and right. And he got to have all that glory already. And so because of that, and because it's so key to his identity and strength and being a strong way, so key to his identity, he can't play the frail card, then have his crisis and write his biography about how he really, he really was a master of the universe. He wasn't just this frail old man, you know, that just ran a, orange stand, a fruit, a fruit stand on the corner, right? <laughs> We're I'm from, just a businessman. Just a businessman. I'm a humble business Importing man. my, you know, my olive oil, olive my oil tomatoes, growing my truck. tomatoes. Carlos Marcello, famous for that, right? So it's a, he's kind of stuck, but he's going to have an existential crisis when it feels like he can't control the law anymore. As I said, this is a man who was a front for the real masters of the universe and who got himself out of trouble by being a rat. He did. Yep. That's why he was never caught. Those are the deals that Donald has made. This, I'm a great, I'm the deal. I do deals. The art of the deal. He was doing deals with the justice department so that he didn't go to prison. So he didn't get indicted. Those Wait, are his deals. What do you call it when that happens? Isn't there a word for it when you give evidence and you can't, you don't get to go to jail. Whatever you say, they can't indict. What's the word for that? Yeah, I have immunity. Right. Oh, my God. It's almost like he's been talking about that constantly it's all week. Like wow. Like, immunity, 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 immunity. And I think there's a point where he's, we'll, let, we'll watch and see. I predict there's a good chance, not 100%, but there's a good chance. If this case looks like it's crushing down on him or the next case crushing down on him and he is going to face a verdict and possibly a conviction. If he can start to feel that, that he doesn't have control over the law anymore, that's where I think he might get reckless, like those old men that are his predecessors facing the death, right? That's the existential threat. And I think we'll start hearing him going, I have immunity because I have a deal with the Justice Department. I control the Justice Department. I have deals with the Justice Department. I just can't see he won't control himself. That's when we know the restraint is gone. Right now, even though it looks like he's unrestrained with witness intimidation and jury tampering and God knows what he's trying with this judge, trust me, that's restraint. That's restraint for this world that this man comes from. That's being in control, that thuggery. There's a point where the thuggery doesn't work and it's clear the thuggery is not going to work where he will lose control, really lose control. And not and just then, in his bowels. Then he's going to start telling who he really is and what his shit was because he does not want to go to prison and he doesn't want to go to his grave without anybody knowing that he actually at one point in his worldview controlled the Justice Department because he could get off from anything. Anyway, that's my big long. I love that's it. That's my take on the I trials. Love it. Clip this whole segment. Get it up there. That's what I say. <laughs> that's Clip what the like. whole thing. All right. There's one thing, though, that doesn't ring true, though, that you said. Like, okay, they made Trump Tower. They made this concrete thing. You said, like, it was a mob thing. But, I mean, if it was a mob place, if Trump Tower was really a mob place, wouldn't there be organized criminals living and operating in Trump oh, yeah. Tower? Yeah. Oh, wait, there were fucking dozens of them. Never they mind. All there. My bad. My and bad. then it turned into why did it turn into an intelligence thing with Donald? Why do we always have why do we have the Saudis? Why do we have the Chinese? Why do we have the Russian mobsters and the Russian spies crawling all over him? Well, because as we have laid out many, many times before, there was a point in organized crime in the fight for the five families in New York City, especially and specifically, and specifically the crime family that Fred worked for that when the Russian mafia rolled in 
right? And then especially in the 90s, early 90s, they just rolled up that crime family because that's the way Russians is it. And they were they there is no Russian mafia without the Kremlin. It does. There's no separation. There's no daylight between. The, it's an arm of the Kremlin. Um, if not the if not the Kremlin is an arm, an of, the arm Russian of the mafia. Yeah, yeah th that's the great debate. Depending on if you're talking to somebody like me who studies organized crime, or you're talking to Sonny who studies intelligence. You know, we that's the one two sides of the coin that we see a different way. Um, I think it's, I think that the Kremlin's tomato, an army. Tomato, tomato, potato, yeah. potato. Just, let's otherwise it wouldn't be a kleptocracy. Yeah. And a mafia state. So, and there's no, there's no getting in business, even as spies, there's no getting in business with organized crime and not having it take you over. So uh, it's just what it does. It's, it's, you know, fascism itself, but there's no being in politics with organized crime and not having it take you over as a fascism really is. If you look at Mussolini, especially. Um, yeah. Yeah, he was a yeah, he yeah. was a gangster. You know, that was all about getting rid of the rule of law, getting rid of accountability so that he could rape and pillage at will and hoard it all for himself and for his cronies. Um, so anyway, it, it's I do want to if anybody wants to read about a big mafia trial that doesn't get enough coverage, that's quite exceptional. And I will will be writing about it one day once all my shit gets worked out. Um Lucky Luciano's trial, when he was finally uh, indicted and brought to trial, um, and it was a black woman who did it, lawyer who who caught him. Amazing story. And Thomas oh, Dewey history rhymes, became, rhymes. Yeah, Thomas Dewey, who became uh, the governor of of New York, eventually was a special prosecutor. She was on his team, and she was the one who caught him and figured it out. Eunice Carter. So. Uh, that they couldn't have that trial in a courthouse because it was such a circus. It was a big deal that the head of all organized crime, because he was the capo de capi at that time, um, and for a long time after that, was facing uh, a prostitution charges, right? And for having an organized prostitution ring operating in New York City and was going to go to prison for that. And he did. But that was a massive story. And the press knew how to cover that. They did cover the circus. They did kind of make it like a circus, but they were also clear that this man's a criminal. And uh, and there was glamour that came along with that, which is why Donald keeps talking about Al Capone, you know, <laughs> like Capone knew how to use the press. I've been invited more than Al Capone, him. the great gangster. Mm -hmm, That's what Trump mm -hmm. said. Yeah. That's what Trump said. worked for Luciano. So, you know, he can talk about being great gangster all he wants, you know. He knows, I don't even know who he, Donald knows his mafia lore in the right way. I think he just knows whatever his dad told him um, and what those, what the Goombas around him told him. So, <laughs> but his, uh, Luciano's trial is sort of a, I think a, uh, it's something that everybody should look at in terms of a model of how to cover this. It's okay to make it a great big circus. It's okay for it to be 24 seven news. It doesn't ever work out for the gangster. It's just not going to work out for him. He's not going to get more votes by having his criminality exposed. I fucking hope not. <laughs> you know, like, He's not. Maybe. I mean, the press has to report on it. Correct. Yeah, it's up to them. Maybe they should go. Didn't wait. Is it World Beneath, you you talked about all that stuff in World Beneath, though, the trial and everything, no? I touched on it a little bit. I didn't, I, yeah. I have a whole other thing I want to do about okay. Luciano and the trial. and No, because I seem to remember it. this. I know about this. But Eunice I'm Carter, you remember, yeah, I did a whole episode um, yeah. to detail because it was every single, every single police officer in New York City, they it was on, they had eight locations they took down in one night and nobody knew what they were doing. Um, because uh, Luciano had so infiltrated, um, I don't remember, I don't know if it's called NYPD at the time, but the police force with his men and, and he had his, his spies in there and everything that they, that Dewey did not trust that, um, if, that if they knew ahead of time, he knew they wouldn't catch anybody. So they hit 80 brothels at once on a cold February night, very cold February night. And, um, 30 of them were tipped off. And so, uh, and they only had five minutes to be tipped off, but 30 of them cleared out, but 50 of them, around 50 of them, they were able to, to grab and they got the, 
they got everybody that was running them. They got the women, they got the pimps, they got the whole thing, the Johns, everyone, and then brought all of those people in um, to the case. So they had tremendous number of witnesses and everything. And the witness intimidation in that case is legendary. <laughs> it's legendary. Wow. And he still went down. He still went down, went to prison. He did. Yeah. And then what he got out that? of prison because he cut a deal with the government. Because it was his, he invented, didn't he invent the idea of being a CI in a sense? Like, he, like he is. He yeah. was the first for national security purposes. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah. <laughs> both he and Lansky. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I have a special fondness for him because, you know, the, Whoever did the voice of him in your Greg voiced shows, him in the, in the podcast. Yeah, he did a great job. Yeah. Um, okay, we should move and on. My that dad was great. voiced Thomas Dewey. I know. So it that was, was he good. did a wonderful job. I don't know what Thomas Dewey looks like, but I imagine your dad as Thomas Dewey. So. Yeah, he looks a little different than my dad, but yeah. it's definitely that sort of. Uh, I think he was from upstate New York, like sort of upper New York, but uh, uh, you know, lawyer. My dad got it. He, he knows. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he got. It. He did a great job. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's not spend eight minutes on this next thing. Let's spend okay. five because we're already. We went long. We Sorry, to, I'm. I we don't was, want people to bail. The mob trial was the guest. No, don't I bail. like the mob trial stuff. We need to do okay. the mob trial, and I feel like it's really important. And we've done what I did. Okay. And also, I don't want to talk about these next people for more than five minutes. So no, it's okay. We have to talk about what happened. I, we were gonna before I came up with the Jody Mitchell titles, which you don't like. We were just going to call this three was going to be mob exclamation point and four would be the traders are easy to spot, which we've been saying for years and years now Yeah, um, on Twitter. But like Marjorie Taylor Green and these people in the house trying to prevent the vote on the Ukraine. I mean, it's not possible to be more easy to spot than this. Like there's uh, that Jay from Kiev account pointed out that the stuff that goes on that marjorie was rolling writing into these amendments she doesn't know about this she doesn't know anything beyond like how to you know do thruples with her guru or whatever <laughs> like she she doesn't know the intricacies of geopolitics enough to write this shit and the guy that is her chief of staff apparently is allegedly very russian up and um you know i Imagine think the kremlin, that. the kremlin has embraced her overtly but like you know She's a fucking traitor. She is a traitor. And it's okay to say that. You know, I, I, I do think it's okay to frame it in this way. Like all of the national security interests of the United States are wrapped in defeating Putin and defending democracy in Ukraine. They just are. So if you're opposed to that, I don't know what to tell you. You're not on the right side. Just defect. Snowden is bored with his lady. He can probably work you in, Marjorie. Just go. Just go. Get out of here. Uh, we don't need you here anymore. Uh, or, you know, there's a there's a dire a life-size diorama of Cro Magdon man somewhere in Europe that you could just stand in and be silent and just have your face there. That she really does. Have you seen the images of her I with can't the Magdon man? Handle it's, it. it's, it's really bad. Yeah. But, uh, and I'm gonna make fun of her because she's a traitor. To yeah. democracy and to the United States of the worst kind. Remember, before she came into power, she was like literally harassing David Hogg, a, a you know, a, a school shooting survivor on the street in DC, accusing him of making the whole thing up. Like she's wackadoo. She was doing and that for Alex Jones, right? She's awful. And mm -hmm. She has no business in the halls of power. I know people give her money because she creates this thing. I know we're not supposed to talk about her, but we do have to talk about her because she's causing problems now. We're in a problem here. This is a problem time where the United States government has to get its fucking shit together to get rid of this little horrible man running Russia and doing war crimes in Ukraine. It has to. It's 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 a shameful that it's taken this long that we haven't even voted on this yet. Another guy who's for this, by the way, is Matt Gates. We've talked about him before. We're going to keep talking about him. You know, I one of the reasons I had Gal on my podcast is because The Atlantic published a piece about Matt Gates titled Matt Gates is Winning. I mean, come on. I know they do these titles where they want you to click in Just rage now? to see. Just hmm? recently? This is a week ago. Yeah. Um. And it's it's a decent enough article where she, you know, she talks about the stuff that he does. But the frame of it is 
he's a firebrand. He's trying to recreate the GOP. And the, no, he's a fucking traitor. And the reason he's a traitor is because he's hoping that a Trump coming in will get rid of his fucking crimes that he's been accused of. As Kevin McCarthy said last week, there's very ample evidence that this guy did the stuff with the 17 year old that did sex traffic her. That did pay her. There's now more reporting coming out today about shit that he was. Yeah, doing. they said minors with an S at the party. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when he was in law school, this is something that was in the article that I did not know. So it's not a terrible article, all told. There's things in it that are useful. Instead of just living where all the other law students lived at William and Mary, he bought this big palatial, you know, beautiful Georgian brick house and turned it into bachelor pad. Yeah. That's how he went through law school this way. And some of the shit went on. God knows what went on. And to your point about, about mob and mobsters, okay, no one will go on the record to talk about this guy because they're fucking terrified of him because his yeah. father has a lot of money and a lot of political power in Florida to the point where no one will talk about him, which is like... I, I, but didn't, didn't it also say in that article that he invited a lot of people to these parties? Yes. That... But good luck finding them because people are scared. And yeah. you know who scares people? Maybe like they're that? people who intimidates that... witnesses like that. What have we seen? I've long maintained that Matt Gates is Trump 2.0. 30 years from now, if this guy isn't stopped, he's gonna be running for president. It's gonna be the same shit, but worse. Yeah. And right now, his priorities line up with what Putin wants. And that's what he's doing. It just is. I don't know what his motives are. I, I don't think he's being I doubt he's being paid. He doesn't need the money, but he is carrying water for this guy in Congress to prevent this shit from happening. Because he's the one that got rid of Kevin McCarthy. And why? Kevin McCarthy thinks it's because of the ethics investigation. But he, he was fine with it until the Ukraine spending bill started to come up. Yeah. Then McCarthy yeah. had to go. Then yeah. McCarthy had to go. You look at the timeline, this shit is super obvious. And that's it. And mm. these people, like, if you're going to write about them, tell the truth about them. Because there is no justification for what they're doing now. There's no justification. It's basically, you know, if you turn on the Russian media and they're talking about you in glowing terms, that's bad. That ain't good. That's not what you want. It's okay to report the truth. That's what he's after. Why is irrelevant. That's what he's doing. He's in I the back. It, it seems like, it does seem like Hill reporters who would be the ones covering this are really very, very young. It doesn't seem like yeah. there's many that are our age and have seen, like, I don't even, I just wonder the depth of, and it's all yeah. has to be so fast. So I feel like that's also a complication. I'm not trying yeah. to be ageist here in reverse. No, it's it's life experience. It does, it's, sure. it, yeah, it does seem like it's like, maybe we've got a generation in there that doesn't quite grasp that, this country has been our enemy in a very real way for a very, very long time. And we all thought it was over. And that was maybe the big con is that they just, maybe there was a moment, maybe there was a one decade in there um, where there was a chance that it could have been a capitalist country and, and a peer and we could have gotten out of all of this, even though it might've been very different. Um, but with Putin at all, that all evaporated. You yeah. know, it went back to being a hostile foreign power looking yeah. to undermine us and to subvert democracy and to take us over and spend like, a let's long make it time easy. cultivating people to do that within our political yeah. parties. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's very clear. I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> if you were them, wouldn't you? How easy would it be to like, I don't know, find some explore talent agency and like whatever, you know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not hard to corrupt Americans. They sent one homely woman from Siberia who was a furniture salesman and she infiltrated half the GOP. She, yeah. It's just not hard to corrupt Americans. And wrote the preface to, uh, was it the preface or the introduction of Patrick Burns book? I can't recall. I don't um, know. <laughs> oh, you haven't read this thing. I, I have not read it. Okay, announcements. Announcements. Okay, Gal Suburban, who was on the show, she's doing a what she calls the Trader Book Club, where she buys these books by these horrible people and reads them. I don't know. 
I, I don't know how she does this, but that's what she's doing. There's there's stuff she's gonna have stuff to report about soon. Okay. I'm, I can't say what it is. We can't say what it is, but I, stuff look, to report I look forward to that. Good. Of interest. It's gonna be of interest. Yay. Uh what do you have? I don't what you know. got? What you got? I got Jack. I think. Um I really do. I can't remember. I'm at this point where I can't remember. I don't even know what day it is. I mean, I guess it's Friday because we're here, but yeah, no. Um, I know what I wanted to say. Yeah. Dickie Betts, RIP. That's what I have to say. Dickie Betts, the, one of the founding members of the Almond Brothers, the guitar player, wrote all the songs, died this week, 80 mm. years old. Uh, are you are, are you an Almond Brothers person? I love the Almond Brothers. Yeah. Okay, good. I yeah, saw yeah. them live. Okay. Oh, that's in like, fun. In like 1993. And my friend and I went to the um, Garden State Art Center in New Jersey. Um, and we're, these, they're up on stage and we're thinking, oh, my God, these guys are so old. And they're literally as old as I am right now. OK. <laughs> At the time. So uh, and I'm glad I got to see them. It was it was a great show and uh, lots of preppy, dorky New Jersey kids. And then a handful of like guys that just clearly followed the band around from the South with the long hair and the beard and the t-shirt and the big buckle belt and the motorcycles. And we were just like, Oh man, I want to fuck with these guys. You know? Uh, anyway, it was great. That's I'm glad great. I got to see him. Uh, Jessica is one of the greatest songs of all time. So RIP yeah. man. And yeah. as usual, we want to thank everybody for watching. We want to thank everybody for subscribing. We want to thank everybody in there for, uh, buying memberships for people, which we always appreciate. And uh, yeah, we love the and community. Hit, hit the like, hit the subscribe, and join. Yeah. Be a member. We're not going to have an after hours this week, but maybe next week. Yeah. Yeah. This whole, this whole show is sort of a long after hours in some sense. It kind yeah. of is because ah, it, it is, we had, just hadn't done one in a long time. So it's fun. Yeah. yeah it is I fun. love it. I love it. it. Okay. All right. The last topic. Last but not least. The gallery, oh, one of the great Joni Mitchell songs. The gallery. That's a. That's a. That's a. Good, really. Is, you, yeah. You gotta no, listen to I that love one. Joni Mitchell. It wasn't that. It was that I got surprised that all of a sudden, and I didn't know what the topics were because we had different titles for the topics, and then I got lost. That's all. Um, but I love Joni Mitchell, and I'm glad to see her songs up there. Okay, so did you see? Raskin and Comer going at it. Love it. <laughs> Love it. And Comer, yeah. I just, I don't know how anyone takes that guy seriously. He's just, he's a it's character. Raskin's, you know, yeah. he has, he's like, he's trying to do the foghorn leghorn thing. He's, he's taking, he's taking that shtick from Kennedy. Yeah. Senator Kennedy. Kennedy has about 40 IQ points on him, but whatever. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I, I think so much of it's performative. Again, we're to the performative thing. Mm -hmm. The one thing I have, so if, if you guys don't know, if you didn't see it, um, Jamie Raskin and whatever Comer, I, I don't even know his first name. James. Yeah, James it Comer. It should be Dick. It would be great if it was Dick Comer. Dick that would be perfect. so fantastic. Yeah. But yeah. alas, no. Yeah. So uh, in his like impeach the house impeachment, whatever, right. Where Raskin is the minority leader on that committee. And they, they just, they don't have anything on oversight oversight. Yeah. They have nothing, nothing, nothing on Joe Biden. They really don't. I mean, I would even be, you know, look, I wasn't kind with family. Willis. like, I'm, I'm there to go. Okay. You're going to find something. Let me see it. Let me see it. And as someone pointed out, like this poor Joe Biden has been like frisked for they've been frisking this guy for 40 years. They can't find anything on him. They keep picking his pockets and just patting him down. And it, it just doesn't exist, guys. He really was happy just being kind of a straight public servant. You know, you could disagree with whether you think he's done a good job or blah, 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 blah. But it's not this the Biden crime family. Right. And this. Blah, 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 right. Again, the projection, the offensive bullshit, because Trump is on trial for being in a fucking criminal and out is going to come all the thuggery of him that he learned from his father and from the men around his father and that his children have learned from him. They're just thugs. So 
one thing I would wish when I saw the exchange between Raskin and Comer, and Raskin was amazing, um, and they just went at each other, it was so great, is Comer was doing a line that is like a whispering thing that that the GOP does, that Republicans do, that's specific to all the folks in their bubble, right? And it's always, and it's, it's like a coy little, you know, whistle. Um, and I, Raskin was genuinely lost because he's not spending his time listening to these folks. Unfortunately, you and I have had to spend some time understanding what the fuck they're talking about and going in and looking at it. And I wish that the Dems were a little bit more prepared for some of that. They've been doing a great job. I think you can get even a little bit more prepared. So by this, I mean, when Comer kept saying, what business are the, is the Biden family in? What business are they in? Are they in real estate? Are they in casinos? And he was listing all the businesses that the Trump family's in. Are you, like, and Raskin was genuinely, genuinely unprepared for that because it's a nonsensical logic train, but it's their <laughs> logic train. And they formed it to sort of say what the undercurrent of and what Comer couldn't get to, but what they've gotten to in the channels and in the and their dis and all their shit where they talk, all their forums where they do their garbage talk, that's MAGA, is <laughs> if they're only in the Biden's like Hunter doesn't have some business. Biden doesn't have some business outside of government. So they must be corrupt because. What else would he, why would he be on the board? Why would he have this consulting gig? Why would they be paying him money if he wasn't uh, doing some kind of corruption in government and for government for business? Well, that's what Jamie couldn't figure out where he was going with it. And then he just sort of dismissed it and then he tacked him and that was fine. But it's good to understand that because you can turn that on Comer in a moment and have Comer get flummoxed. And the way to do that is to say, Hunter Biden is not in the business of politics. He's a consultant. It would be no different if he was a doctor, if he was a lawyer, if he was, you know, whatever he is. And you can take that up with him. Unlike that, let's talk about the businesses that the Trump family and the Kushners are in. They are in real estate. They are in casinos. They are in caskets, right? <laughs> Avanga and Chinese and patents. Fashion and Chinese know. patents. They are in there. There are in the businesses with the Qataris and they're in the business with the sovereign wealth funds and they're in the business in in speculation. They're in financial business. Jared Kushner thought he was going to run a tech company that could be a med tech company to, to COVID. Right. They they to, the point of being in office is that you don't have these businesses. You should sell these businesses. We have laws where people have to put those businesses something because that's actually what you'll be funneling government funds into and using your government office and your government position uh, to corrupt and enrich yourself. They're not in the business of hotels where heads of state come into the DC to stay in the hotel. And if you pay the exorbitant prices of staying in this fucked up hotel that was formerly a post office, that that's gonna get you the ear of the president. The Bidens don't have those businesses to peddle Joe Biden does not have a business to peddle and get favors from. So you're quite right to be focused on that, Mr. Comer. And so let's investigate Jared Kushner's $2 billion. Let's investigate the emoluments that came on, came in during the Trump administration. Let's investigate what Kellyanne Conway was doing, right? By holding, hawking wares and goods. Let's investigate the people who were in this office who did have businesses who refused and failed to, to turn those businesses over into trust to do the things that they need to do so that we knew that corruption wasn't happening and bet, use the office of the presidency or their proximity to the president as family members to enrich themselves beyond their wildest fucking dreams. Let's go ahead and investigate that because that's not the business Joe Biden is in or has been in. He's been a public servant. That's how you turn that argument around. And then what happens when you can do that to these people is they will never go to that line again because they don't know how to come back from that. So you've just snatched from the top of their heroic, you know, their bloviation pile, right? Their pompousness pile. You've snatched their biggest fucking thing that's their whispering to the base of it. Oh, they must be. 
they must be corrupt or they would have some other business they would be in. You've just, their bullshit garbage logic train, you've just derailed it with actual logic and actual facts and actual corruption. That was good. You landed that right on time. That's very it. impressive. Yeah. And I've got nothing to add. I mean, yes, I, I, <laughs> I don't think it takes much to flummox Comer. I'm just going to say, <laughs> I think he's, he's an easily flummoxed chap. I, I think a lot of things maybe puzzle him. I think as, he's very confused and lost. I don't, does he know but yeah. again, taking away their semantics yeah. is the key. Yeah. You've got to get these people back on their heels. And the only thing they have are their garbage, you know, fabricated logic train word salads that make sense to their base. So they all know, oh, it's all an implication. Oh, like, let's go, Brandon. Right. It's all a let's go, Brandon. And what you've got to do is snatch that from them. Because then they have nothing. They can't govern. They don't know what their job is other than that and getting getting on Fox News. They don't. They, so if you take away their tool, the one tool they have, it's easy to take it away. Just take it away from them. That's all. They're done. Yeah. I think it's good. Um. I got nothing else to add other than, I mean, other people have pointed this out. Jimmy Carter sold his peanut farm. I mean, I the, 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 the disparity between him and Trump is just, uh, it, it's like between here and the sun, you know, Elon Musk has to go into a rocket and fly off somewhere far away to measure it. The disparity there yes. like in, in the, and I think to your point, they don't understand Biden because they cannot fathom someone actually just wanting to do good shit for people. Right. Like it's so foreign to them to like, I don't know, help someone or make the world a better place or do civic duty or not like take advantage of your position in some way that they well, can't never, fucking They've never fathom tried. It. They've never tried. They don't no. even attempt to govern anymore. No, it just, it, it, they've never tried. These are people who, you know, who Christians, we're Christian, white Christians, and they they don't go to church. They don't read the Bible. They don't, they, they, they've they never done anything. They've never invested any time or any pursuit. They're not curious. They're incurious and they're artless and they're lazy. Also dumb. Can we say dumb? Well, those things create the idiot. Yeah. I don't know what comes first, <laughs> the idiot or the egg. I'm not quite sure. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So. And some of them maybe aren't dumb, but if you're, yeah. if you're, if you have native intelligence and you're not using it in some way and you're just dumbing yourself down, I hate that almost more than anything, honestly. It yeah. really bothers me. Yeah. So that's how it is. Uh, anyway. It's been a fun show. <laughs> it's a lot, fun covered a lot of ground. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've got nothing else to add. Um, I don't either. I don't know. I, I've I've uh, I've been tied to the whipping post. Oh Lord, I feel like I'm dying. <laughs>